what's happening. So we might just get started on today's one. So welcome everybody. Good to have you here. Um, as I said, we're going to focus on a &R. My name's John Corse. I'm one of the founders of Vicious along with Andy Van, who you'll get to speak to in a second and will introduce himself. We've been an independent Australian music label releasing dance music to the world for over 25 years. Um, started as a passionate music fan and as DJs, built a little studio, started making music, started the label along with a guy called Colin Daniels who now works for PS out of the USA. Um, he's no longer involved with Vicious, but we're all still mates. So there was no infighting there. Um, and yeah, so I run the label as a general manager, but also when we have key A&R uh, discussions about music, we tend to have a bit of a collaborative approach in that um, the individual guys sign music, but we do um, try to have, uh, when projects become super important, and we're listening to music, we try and have, you know, the whole team kind of at least have a listen to it so that we know what's going on and we can, you know, in an open room discuss, oh, hey, this could be cool or this could be cool. So I might just introduce you to the rest of our A&R guys um, and they can say hello. So firstly, over to you, Andy Van. Hey, everyone. Um, yes, my name's Andy Van, that's correct. I'm a director, owner and head of A&R at Vicious. Um, I've been there right since the start with John and Colin and um, also been doing a and pretty well right from the start. Uh, for people that don't know, um, I uh, basically signed and developed Avicii with the label and the team. Obviously also signed Madison Avenue to um, Vicious and was one half of that group, but also a and would it with John. Um, I also signed and developed Dirty South, um, Cabin Crew, Sergeant Slick, Jolly and Petch, Obviously, with the team, of course, not just me, but um, Ian Carey, Tommy Sunshine, that's, you know, sort of some of the notable names. Um, and on an artist front, um, I started off with many, many artist names. Astral Project was a very, very early one for people that are over 30 years old. Um, over 50. And, <laughs> over, maybe over 50. No, um, <laughs> and um, from then... Um, I started an artist called Madison Avenue. Um, obviously, you guys, well, most of you would know the, the hits of Don't Call Me Baby and Who the Hell Are You? That was back in 1999 to 2002. After that, I started uh, an artist called Vandalism. Um, we did 15 releases and 40 plus remixes. Um, and that, that ran for about 14 years. And um, then um, I've started a new artist called Super Disco Club, uh, which uh, I started last year. And that's my current artist. And um, yeah, so throughout the chat, if you've got any A&R questions, um, please just type them in. I'll answer whatever I can about what labels are looking for. Um, not necessarily just Vicious. I, I, this is not about signing to Vicious. This is a chat about how you can sign to any label um, and what things to, um, to, to, to do with your tracks, to do with your artist, to do with your brand. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll um, pass back to John to uh, introduce the uh, next person. Yeah, thanks, mate. Also, just quickly, we won't be listening to music in this session, obviously, because we could get bombarded with music and songs. It's really an information session, not an individual listening session. Of course, we will have uh, the best place to send demos for us at the end. Uh, so just keep that in mind. I'll hand you over to Guy Lewis, who looks after Be Rich Guy. Sorry, you're muted. One second. Why are you still muted? There you go. How are you going, everyone? Uh, my name is Guy Lewis. Um, I run uh, the Be Rich Records label uh, under Vicious Recordings. Um, I started at Vicious uh, in 2007 uh, as an intern, um, and we started Be Rich uh, around late 2010. Um, I guess it was just started as a uh, as an alternative kind of electronic music label um, to what uh, you know the vicious main label um, was putting out, which I guess was more the um, you know the the mainstream club music uh, and and dance stuff uh, you know such as the pop bellies at the time. Um, we wanted to do something different, um, a little bit left of center, and at the time I guess the the fidget electro kind of scene was was booming, and that was where it, we've got its start but I guess over the years it's developed into a very multi-genre label um 
I've worked with uh, Peking Duck. Um, we were the first label to sign Peking Duck, obviously. Um, and now they've gone on to sign it with uh, their massive success. Um, I also worked in A&R for Angademus, um, who a uh, uh, big artist out of Indonesia um, in, you know, throughout the EDM uh, sort of years um, and, and still going. Um, I guess more recently, guys like Max Amono from Germany um, and Dugong Jr. Um, and, uh, and I also work in management for a couple of other artists, uh, three of whom are on the label, Illustrated, Friendless and Needs No Sleep. Um, and I also manage an R&B artist called Mac Moses. Um, and yeah, I guess I got my start uh, as a DJ, um, uh, 2001, 2002, um, been DJing since then. Um, I guess most notably, I've DJed as Buster Stick Up. Everyone knows me as Buster. Um, so, yeah, that's me. Great. So, um, what happens with most of our music is one of these two guys um, generally takes over a project once we kind of decide to sign it. Some things they'll be passionate about and be like, I really want to do this. Other things we'll have a group chat about and we'll all put our two bobs worth in until we decide what we want to do with a project that gets presented to us. But what I'm going to start off with basically is ask the guys, um, what are the kind of the first thing? I mean, we all look for great music, obviously, but outside of great music, just tell if you can each individually, Andy, you go first, yep. let the guys know what the process is. Once you hear a great demo, you start looking online, you start seeing their social followings, you start, looking them up as DJs. Can you give us a rundown of the initial process that as a label we do and probably most labels would do as soon as they even hear a good song? Yeah, so I, I would, I'd say the process would be hear a track. If the track has got some potential, it doesn't necessarily have to have the greatest hooks. Um, it might have some potential in production, might be cutting edge production, but you know, the wrong vocals or something like that. I'll think to myself, there's something here, something worth investigating um, or worth following up. So the first step would be the, the initial demo. If there's other demos in the package, obviously I would listen to all of those. And again, they don't have to be um, finished, mixed down, produced songs. A lot of people think labels just want finished mixed songs. Some major labels, maybe like a Sony or something like that, maybe more in that way, but a label like Vicious, looks for songs that have got potential and I really couldn't care less if they're mixed down or not. I'm looking for potential and we know what a song can be 25% better or 50% better if it's mixed down and, and made more dynamic and made more exciting or has better vocals. So first things first is listening to the song, listening to any other tracks. Then from then on, I would look at the artist, find out more about it. Has this person got a social following? Has this person released stuff on Spotify or the labels? Has this person uh, got a SoundCloud page, Facebook page? And I would look at all those things um, to see basically background of the artist and also what the artist, artist is currently doing. Are they a DJ? Are they doing festivals? Are they on Triple J? Are they, um, you know, remixing, producing for other people? Finding out as much as I can because often people undersell themselves in, in, a, um, in a presentation, which is fine. Um, and if, when they send the demo, so we don't know enough about them. So that's what we'll do the research on. Um, it's always handy, I, I think, to make it easier for labels is to have a list of links below saying, this is my previous release on another label. This is a big remix I did in Spain. Um, this is my Facebook and, and have all that information easily there in the email. I think that's a vital, vital thing to have. Um, yeah, and doing just a little sort of almost one paragraph blurb on yourself. Um, I think that's really, really important. But that's that's the process that I would take. And again, don't be fearful of sending something that is half finished or even just two minutes long. Um, back in Avicii days, uh, when I, I was going through Avicii demos, he would literally have songs that were half finished, one minute long, two minute long tracks, and would send three of those. And um, I still to this day subscribe to that. Um, premise because one song he might have spent 20 hours on and thinks it's fantastic and then he's got two other demos that are only two minutes long and I we actually often went for the smaller songs that he spent less time on because they were ideas that were germinating into something great so it, it, that's really all I can say but just 
just send ideas rather than finish songs, I would suggest, and have a background on yourself. Guy, you want to weigh in from your perspective? I think Andy pretty much nails it. Um, yeah, uh, as Andy said, it's, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes it's got, it's, uh, it's about receiving a demo um, and, and obviously doing the, uh, asking the right questions and, and doing that background research on, um, you know, where an artist is coming from. I mean, it does, you know, just because you're a, if you're a debut artist doesn't mean um, it's a, you know, you need to you know, be developed yourself. Um, you know, sometimes we hear uh, something in, in someone who's never put a record out before. Um, and I've worked with, you know, plenty of debut artists, uh, one of them being uh, Pete and Duck. So, um, so yeah, we never know, uh, you know, what could happen. I guess it's just hear, hear about hearing the, uh, something special in the demos. Um, or sometimes, you know, uh, I'll hear something uh, on, uh, you know, Spotify um, or Unearthed Radio and I do some research and find out these guys are, you know, self-releasing their music and you have to reach out and start a conversation, see what they're, what they're doing and, and, and what they're working on. Um, so, you know, it's, it starts both ways. But I think it's definitely about, uh, you know, being confident in the music that you're, that you're making, that you feel like it's, uh, it's, it's on par with what's in the market. And... Um, and understanding what it what it takes uh, outside of just being a talented uh, uh, at making music um, and uh, you know everything else that surrounds being an artist these days in terms of your brand and you know live shows and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, I would uh, I would definitely have all your ducks in a row before you you start you know fishing for uh, for labels. Um. Contrary to popular belief, A&R stands for Artist and Repertoire, not Alcohol and Restaurants. Um, and Although that is I, a good part of it. Yeah. <laughs> so when we talk about um, Artist and Repertoire, it's obviously straight away the conversation's about more than one music, more than one song, and it's also about the artist as a whole. So I think also when you're sending music, your initial contact... Um, you need to know and do a little bit of homework about where you're sending your music because if you're targeting, if you're a, an electronic kind of, let's say you're an electronic hip hop act, you really should be know that you send your demo and you target Guy at Be Rich Records and you don't target Andy. That doesn't mean Andy doesn't have, um, you know, will like the song. He might love the song, but the same thing if you're making techno, you want to be sending it to labels that put out techno music if you're i mean it seems pretty obvious but the amount of demos that we get that don't fit our label is amazing and i think the only thing i'd add to that is yeah from from you from your end as artists who are making music developing music um really understand have your own idea of where your music fits in the whole global market place and music sphere and that doesn't mean whether it's successful or unsuccessful, um, but it certainly does mean, you know, what are the other artists that your music will resonate with? When you're making music, you should be able to tell us, if we ask you, okay, what other artists do you think resonate with what you're doing? Wh who, would, who would play your songs? Which DJs out there in the world would play your music? That's questions that we ask to ourselves when we're getting demos and we're developing artists. Where does this fit? Where should we be targeting? Because once we have a rough idea of where it fits, and even if it's left field jungle with an African edge and a you know Chinese vocal on it, trust me, there's somewhere out there that's doing something like that, and that'll help us to find you know where it is, or it might be something that's completely crazy and brand new. Um, I might ask the guys, guy, I'll ask you first. What are the, the kind of biggest mistakes that you see when you get music delivered to you initially, the first, very first kind of step? Um, uh, I guess um, BCC uh, is a big one. Um, you know, if you're, if you're, if I'm sent a demo and it's sent to 20,000 uh, other a and you know, contact email addresses off of some database you bought online, um, I'm, probably probably not going to reply to that one um 
And uh, and then once again, I would probably prefer to be getting uh, an email directly to me, not like a blanket email out regardless. Um, so, you know, like John said, you need to know who you're sending your music to, um, you know, not just sort of uh, napalming um, a contact list and hoping to, to get a few bites back. Um, that really helps and also, you know, send send your best stuff um don't send everything uh send what you truly believe is your best stuff um but you know as andy touched on you know it's good to send a couple of extra extra tracks on there um you know in case we we you know we like something we want to hear a bit more um but yeah limited to i would say three or four demos most um and uh i don't know about anyone else but i like private soundcloud links it's just easy to listen to stuff like that um or dropbox i guess is okay but um, but yeah, uh, don't use any weird uh, send spaces or anything like that because I probably won't open that either. So um, uh, we use another thing um, called uh, Demo Box on Labelworks, which is really cool, um, which is uh, our main uh, demo link goes to that and you can drop your demos through um, uh, like a box that we can go and listen to and that gets checked uh, on a weekly basis. Um, so yeah, there's, uh, there's different methods of doing it, but it's definitely important, as uh, as John said, know who you're sending the music to. Um, you know, don't just uh, you know send uh, send to everyone. You know, hoping that someone's going to come back. Because I think it's very important that you you have, I guess, your goals as to the labels that you you know if you if you're making music, you know what labels are putting out the artists and the music that you love. You know, maybe they're you know, a higher tier, but you know, you never know. Um, so you just keep reaching out, be persistent, and um, but I, I mean, I reply to everyone, uh, you know, as long as it's uh, presented in the way that, you know, makes me feel like they're actually trying to reach out to me, um, I'll always reply. So, um, so yeah. Andy, anything you want to add? Uh, yeah, two things to that. Um, one is, is a quite a funny one. I often get demos from, it's not so much Australian guys, but it's definitely overseas guys, um, where they'll say, this is one of the best songs you'll ever hear. Um, this is, de you know, destined to be a, a monster hit. You, you, you need to sign it type emails. Um, maybe it works overseas in the States or something. I don't know. It doesn't really work in Australia. Um, you know, just, just as John touched on, just say, you know, this is a club track. I think it could do really well. You can say things like that, but I, I wouldn't say it's the greatest song ever because um, that tends to turn people off. Um, that's definitely something that's a, a no. A guy said as well, you know, I would, I, I, I would definitely say a sentence like, it doesn't have to be vicious, could be any label, love your label, um, I, I know you release great vocal house or you released great tech house to, to that label, um, I follow your label. So, so basically indicate that you know the label that you're hitting, sending it to, hitting up I should say, and I, I, would, I would say I think this particular demo would be great for the label or this one, and I've also attached um, a, a snippet of this one. Another one I, I did want to mention earlier is uh, samples are, some people are very negative on samples, other labels are very open. We're very open to samples because a lot of tracks are based on samples, as, as you can tell in the current scene. Um, a lot of things are covers or, or having a snippet of an old sample in there. We're not adverse to hearing demos like that as well. So, yeah, cool. Yeah. Um I mean, I think that the only thing I'd add to that is it kind of comes back to understanding where you kind of fit and what sort of music you're making. It kind of starts, as soon as you start to understand that, it starts to um, help with how you steer your music from that point forward. So if you've got a good understanding of what you're doing and where you want to be and what sort of music you want to make, that should steer almost everything related to it from that point forward because... You know, if you are making underground techno music, you obviously would aspire to be DJing at a revolver, not at um, the Emerson on a Saturday night. So it, it drives your DJ decisions. It drives your production decisions. It potentially drives your remix decisions um, and everything from that point forward. But the other interesting thing I think that you need to do when you're talking about signing music is you have to understand that um, the commitment that you make is similar to the commitment that you're going to get back. So if you're just sending one song to 
Central Station Records and one song to Vicious and one song to Defected and one song to Tool Room and one song to, uh, you know, wherever it might be. You're kind of throwing everything at the wall. Now, what happens if one of those labels makes, says, I want to pursue your music? We are going to nearly always want to do multiple records with you. A Peking Duck's a great example, which Guy can talk you through in a second. But, you know, we had Peking Duck signed for eight records. Record number five was the first one that Triple J played. Record number six, Triple J played. Record number seven was high. Record number, um, sorry, record number four and five were the first two Triple J played. Then six, seven and eight were, take, were high, take me over and say my name. So it's a very long process for artists to break. And if you only are committing to labels, and it may not be a label, it could be, a, we're not saying you need to sign necessarily to a label, it could be a distribution agreement for your music. It could be um, committing to a manager to work with you for a period of time to help break your music, a publicist, whatever it is. If you're only committing for one song, it's always going to be harder to get them to buy in and love your brand. So, Guy, maybe just have a quick example of some of the artists that we've developed and how long they've taken to start to break through. Um, well, yeah, Peking Duck is a good example. Um, how long in time, Guy, was it from demo one to a hit record? Uh, or being high. High was their fourth single that we released. Um, as John said, uh, oh, sorry, high was, I take that back. High was number five. Uh, the, the record that broke Triple J was um, The Way You Are, um, the, which was their, their fourth release with us. And um, it was kind of a, a, a new sound for them at the time as well. Um, up until then, we'd done three um, quite club orientated uh, fidget uh, electro records. Um, which were really hot, um, but um, and and had success in their own right in terms of DJ support and and charting. Um, but it was the way you are that sort of flipped it for them. Um, so I'm not telling everyone to change their sound, obviously, but the, at that time, that's that's something that cut through for them. Uh, Triple J loved it. Um, was they were all over it, and then High came through um, as an instrumental demo to me. Uh, next um, and uh, I guess we're sort of still leaning on a lot of the, the the sound design they'd kind of built with the electro stuff but really taking it in a in a, in a new direction um, and yeah and when we had the vocal on that one we just knew it was a hit um, and yeah it just the rest is history but um, but yeah I guess other than them um, uh, uh, friendless that I'm currently working with um, he's uh, he's been quite successful in Clubland um, for many years, but um, it's only been in the last um, just over 12 months that we've started to see um, a lot of attention for him and his music um, with uh, Triple J Unearthed and, and I guess uh, a lot more support on spot plays with Triple J um, and his brand has, has built uh, really strongly just over the last 12 months in that space. Um, where he's been, you know, had really strong club records and, and club chart success for um, the last few years. Uh, and yeah, so, um, you know, and we're up to, I think, eight, or maybe the next one might be the ninth single from Friendless. So, um, so yeah, but, you know, it's, uh, I guess it's all sort of evolution. It really depends on the where the market sits at the time as well. Um, you know, I think the, with the Triple J market, there's definitely a lot more, uh, the door is a lot more open for electronic and dance music artists than it was, let's say, you know, uh, you know five to 10 years ago, um, uh, especially with more club oriented artists like Dom Dollar, Torrent Foot, uh, Endor, um, you know, Fisher, obviously. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of helped um, you know, open the doors a little bit more to more club oriented artists, I think, whereas I think a lot more of the dance electronic music that they supported in the past, were more, more of your, your, your live dance acts um, uh, or, you know, uh, more indie uh, sort of orientated acts, which is, you know, is still cool, but I think it's, uh, it's broadening um, that market a lot more. So, 
Um, so yeah, there's definitely, uh, you know, uh, it definitely takes uh, a time to build a brand and build your, um, your fan base. Um, especially if you, you're coming to a label as a, someone who's only put out a couple of records, uh, in the past or even a debut artist, but, um, it definitely pays off to, for, to go into a, a real partnership with a, with a label. Um, and, re and I guess really trust the team that you're, you're signing with as well um you know you've got to have a good working relationship with your a and r um you know and uh or the, you know, the rest of the team at the label and be confident in the way that they they work and um and yeah just uh, that's uh that's really what, what it's about yeah i mean the the thing to remember there's hundreds of thousands of labels out there and at the end of the day and there's outside of labels there's distribution methods there's um ways to get your music out where you just do it so-called yourself but there's always going to be people that are in your team whether they be the people at your label whether they be your management whether they be your boyfriend or girlfriend who's giving you feedback every day because they hear this sound coming out of the spare room and they're like i hate that record i love that record i actually had an artist who used to if they made a club record and their and their girlfriend was like what's this one? They were like, okay, this has got, you know, because um, the artist's girlfriend literally listened to pop radio, wasn't into dance music really, didn't go out clubbing that much. So actually trusted her ear that when something pricked up her ear, that was like, okay, there could be something in this. So, I mean, part of the A&R relationship with any good A&R person and a good label is that you're throwing back and forwards ideas and you have trust that you can rebound ideas off that other person. If it's a label, in our case, it's obviously our a and team. Um, and as I said, sometimes a record will get played, guy will be playing it in the office. I'll be like, oh, what's this? Oh, this is the new Dugon Jr. Oh, this sounds cool. You know, like I love that vocal or, um, or that bit sounds weird or... So we get a collective feedback ourselves. And I think you guys need to you know, artists need to do the same and they need to have some fellow DJs or producers or even just friends who they can trust their opinion, um, not necessarily about the technical qualities because that requires a little bit more experience, but certainly about the overall vibe of how your songs are comparing to one another because you can get stuck in your own little rabbit hole, never finish music, you know, never get stuff finished, never think it's right to present to somebody there does come a point where you need to go, this record's kind of done now. I think it, I've got it as far as I can get it under my own skills. I'm going to pass it on. I'm going to play it to a label. I'm going to play it to my label. Or I'm going to play it to my trusted group, whether it be my manager or my, could be your tour manager sometimes because they're into music, could be a fellow DJ. Um, Andy, do you want to just quickly run through the kind of timeline on, on Avicii and, and how it kind of progressed and how long that took? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So um, from, I would say, I, I met Avicii and basically he was a young guy sitting in his single bed apartment and just had a whole bunch of what I said, short ideas. Um, and basically we signed him and it was, maybe two or three months for his first track to come out. Um, we sort of worked with him on, on some sort of vocal ideas. He wasn't keen on vocal ideas. He'd most basically made it instrumental. Um, and we suggested that um, he put a, a, a vocal hook on it because even tiny vocal hooks tend to connect when you're a young artist because people are not going to know the name of a, of a track with a piano line in it, um, unless you're maybe Eric Prids. Um, but you know, Eric Pridd's first track maybe didn't resonate with people because people didn't know what it was. So at some point you've got to either be an artist big enough where people can recognize the song as in the melody, or you need some sort of vocal hook so people understand there's, a, there's, a, there's something there. So in his case, the first track was called Sound of Now. And I suggested a vocal like that. I can't actually remember if he came up with the words or I did, but basically it, it was some way of, of, of people hearing the track in a club and hearing a vocal saying the sound of now and then basically they could look up the track it's it's a little different now because you've got shazam 
but we're talking about 2008. So uh, that was 12 years ago, of course, or just over. And uh, people weren't able to Shazam a song in a club. They, they just had to go by their ears. So that was their Shazam. So, um, so from that point on, basically every two or three months, he would send three or four demos um, with his manager and uh, we would go through them. And uh, at the time, and that, this, this method is also super important, which I didn't mention earlier, um, he would release one track and then he would also, as in on Vicious, and then he would also leak, you know, a track for people to download for free, or he would, um, you know, do some sort of deal with his manager where it, it would be a free track um, that if you signed up to his SoundCloud page, then you would get a free track or, and a lot of artists do that as well. So giving something away for free is super important at the early part of your career. Um, so I would say every three or four months, he would have a track. So four tracks a year, I think is average. And around that time, he was giving away three or four tracks a year as well. So I think that's vitally important for artists to take on board. Any artist, even larger artists um, do it. Um, uh, Hardwell was one that would give away bootlegs all the time. And that helped his brand become much larger in the world. So I think that's the processes. And for us, it, we did eight tracks in two and a half years. So that basically gives you an idea that every track was almost... Um, Every, every three months. Yeah, I mean, not that we condone bootlegging, but we're all DJs. We all have always bought bootlegs. This vinyl collection behind me is probably half full of bootlegs. Um, it's not so much about bootlegging to make money. It's more about positioning your artist and, and touching the market with music. There's multiple ways you can do it. You can do it with releases. You can do it with official remixes. But the important thing is to try and make sure that when you're doing stuff, there's some thought process behind it. So if you want to put a song on, you know, we've had artists sign with us and they're like, I want to be able to do some free releases that I give away on this portal and that portal. And we're like, why? Oh, I just want to do it. Well, that's probably not great. But if you've got a, a solid theory, okay, because in between releases, I want to look after the market that has supported me from when I started I want to do some giveaways just for the club that I'm a resident DJ at or whatever it might be. There's multiple ways to do it. But at the end of the day, the important thing is that um, you've thought through how you're going to use your arsenal of music to help your career. And whether that be through official releases, giveaways, um, putting releases up where everybody can get them off SoundCloud for nothing, remixes, bootlegs of music, I mean, you wouldn't be doing a bootleg of Beyonce if you weren't in the commercial pop R&B field unless you're going to do a really underground, weird, messed up version. So again, you can get some um, artist to artist um, link into the artists that resonate with you and the sort of music that you're making. You want to be doing gigs around those artists. You want to be playing their music. You want them playing your music and you know, obviously that's the sort of artist that you'd look at, um, you know, associating yourself with, I guess. Um, from a technical standpoint, I might get the guys just to give some feedback. I mean, as Andy said earlier, he's never as concerned about the technical side of it as he is about the creative side of it at the start. And I think that's a really important distinction because in this day of the bedroom producer, I mean, you don't have to do everything yourself. You can have engineers help. You can have, obviously, we get everything mastered. Um, so, Annie and Guy, just give us a bit of an insight into, you know, I guess um, your thoughts on how the technical side can be improved and maybe for artists not to worry so much about the detail there. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in quickly because I don't want to um, say everything and then Guy doesn't have his input. <laughs> um, basically, demos are great. Um, sometimes we'll suggest literally working with another producer to improve it. Uh, we've done that in the, in the past where someone's made a great track, but the drums are terrible or, or the bass line is just lost in the mix because it was a bad preset or a bad sound that he chose. So uh, again, I, I did touch that on that at the start. It's not about having the greatest demo. It's about having the greatest ideas. That's hundred percent important. So I would uh, not stress about that, but yeah, we definitely, uh, if the track is pretty good and needs a good mix down, then there's engineers in Australia, engineers overseas that we use. 
Um, Guy's got some companies that he works with, which he'll touch on shortly, I'm sure. Um, and from that point, we'll get a mix down done, send it back to the, to the artist. Um, and the mix down would also have a reference where we would ask the artist, what track do you think this, your track sounds like or should sound like or should be on, the, on par with? Because that's one thing that people don't get a, a lot, uh, not always, but a lot is that their track sounds good, but that might sound good on their computer speakers or in their bedroom, but it may not sound great in a club. It may have way too much bass or what, no, nowhere near enough bass or, you know, kicks too loud or kicks too thin. So you, you've got to have a reference point where you listen to your track against a similarly um, sounding track and you, and you basically refer to that or, or a, what we call a being where you listen to that, then listen to yours, listen to that, and then listen to yours. Doing it in Ableton is a really handy way. You listen to two bars of their track and then two bars of your track in the drop. So that's a good way to do it. And as I said, we mix it down and get the artist's input. We don't mix it down and never listen to them. We, we get their input and then potentially we even get it played out in clubs um, by ourselves. Um, I'll often say to John, can you play this out on the weekend and give me your thoughts? Um, we might do one or two revisions to that mix down and then get it mastered. Well, mastered at the same time generally, but yeah, get some revisions and remastered. Um, and then that's, that's the track. That's the, that's, that's the process from my point, but guy, guys definitely got a different angle as well. Cause sometimes guys got nothing to do with clubs. So guys got a different angle. Um, I mean, I mean Andy kind of, uh, yeah, uh, outlined, you know, basically what, what happens, but, um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's important to to know that there's there is a difference between being a, an artist, producer, and an audio engineer. Um, not everyone is a shit hot audio engineer, so don't stress if your your stuff maybe sonically in terms of your mixes and you, uh, are not um, amazing. But um, if you truly believe you've got uh, amazing sounds and ideas, and your writing um, is is good, then uh, a good A and R should be able to hear that and go, we've got something here, and this is how we can add these extra, you know, bits and pieces to to make this a finished product. So, I mean, there's plenty of you know really big and uh, uh, yeah, prominent artists that that uh, that that really are just the 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 ideas and the and the the inception of a of of what a song is um and they have a team that can come in and go and 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 make it reality um so uh, yeah i mean yeah it's uh, i think that's it's really about having uh, having good demos and songs and then um you know if you need that extra help um to you know uh, add the bells and whistles into um you know uh, uh, finishing a mix um you know getting a mastering engineer getting another producer in to to help um you know develop stuff um you know there's there's that's uh, commonplace now i don't think there's any <laughs> there's any shame in it at all um so yeah um but you know there's uh, it's definitely about finding you know everyone has their own uh, opinions as to who they're who they think does the best mixes or does does the best masters it's each their own you know find someone who who works well with you um and yeah i think that's uh that's the way to do it yeah i mean when um we're talking about comparing we're not talking about comparing notes so much we're obviously talking about you know a b something is my hi-hat cutting through like the hi-hat on that record that i play out in a club and i know that it sounds great because when i play it the whole vibe of the room's rocking because the bass is great, the kick drum's great, the hi-hat's great, and the mix down's awesome. If you're a being and you're comparing to that and you might have better musical notes, you may have better musical hooks, but if your production's not cutting it, um, that might be what's letting it down. And again, you know, you can, you can partner up with other people to improve that stuff. I mean, obviously ghost producing, there's this huge debate about what people do and how they do it and, you know, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, there's been collaboration in music and in production for a billion years and there always will be. So, you know, Peking Duck, we had Sam Lamore come in and do some production stuff with um, Peking Duck. We also had Sam Lamore come in and do some production stuff with the Pop Valleys. Um, on a smaller level, we've had collaborations that we've heard demos and just got smaller other producers who we like their technical skills to help improve the technical side of a record. So 
no shame in it. It's standard to do. It's about improving what comes out the other end of your music. And um, ultimately, you know, that's the goal. The other thing to remember is you need to have a little bit of a thick skin when you're dealing with, <clears throat> with music. I mean, um, of course, labels get it wrong and feedback people get wrong. And when I say wrong, that's just their opinion that something, hey, this isn't for me, this isn't going to work. I mean, the Rolling Stones, they didn't get signed to their first deal. The Beatles didn't get signed to their first deal. They got knocked back by people. You know, some of the biggest acts in the world have been, had no's from people. Sometimes your music may not just resonate with somebody. But if you send it to 10 labels and they all say, this song's not good enough, I would suggest that you don't try and put it out yourself. Um, Calvin you know, Harris, Calvin Harris may disagree, John. He's got eight, eight, um, eight denial letters, one from defected included, and he's kept the wall on his wall. <laughs> well, I get, well, yeah. I mean, look, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there are, um, I'm sure there are exceptions to the rule, but <laughs> I mean, I couldn't imagine personally defected signing the first Calvin Harris record. It doesn't sound like a yeah. defected record to me. And I guess that's one of the things about, you know, maybe early days he loved Defected, but he sent demos that didn't resonate. And you also have to remember, this is another thing that I think is important about when you're sending music is <clears throat> every label's got a roster of artists. You know, every, everybody thinks about a label like Defected, like an amazing home for a house, for a traditional house music song. But they've got Dennis Ferrer. You know, they've got Kings of Tomorrow. They've got, um, you know, Soul Furic. They've got some of the biggest traditional house music producers that the world has ever known. They're not necessarily looking for another person that makes American-style traditional vocal house music. Obviously, if you have an amazing song, any A&R is going to listen to it. But sometimes um, you may be better sending your music to a label that, is it's slightly different to everything else that's on that label's roster because that may be why the label goes, oh, this is interesting. We don't have anybody like this. This is a fresh kind of artist for us. Um, and they may get really excited um, about, sorry, I've just got some people coming into the room. Um, they may get really excited about a project because it is a little bit different to everything else that's out there that they're doing. So I think that's something else that you can keep in mind. We might um, <clears throat> just open up the um, floor to some questions. So if anybody's got any questions, you can type them into the chat room and I'll either unmute you to ask the question or I'll read the question out. If you could also, though, when you do jot in your details, let us know where you're um, from. Interesting from Matt. Yeah, I bet he was happy playing the virtual festival. Um, yes, too true. <laughs> I'm sure our defective were quite happy to have Calvin Harris involved now. But I mean, look, that's just a creative thing that, you know, who knows what the circumstances were at the time. Um, you know, I'm sure there was labels that said no to Fisher and look how big Fisher's been, you know. And, uh, and for anyone listening, uh, we got no's on Don't Call Me Baby as well. We got a lot of yeses where people said, yes, let's sign it. But we actually got people not wanting to sign it as well. So it, it's... It's, John was right. Sometimes people have, and it's actually one other point further to John, sometimes people have got releases for, the, for their label for the next four months. They've already done, they're all, all ready to go. They've got four months of releases coming up and they're not interested in signing anything, no matter how good it is. So you might send the best demo ever, that could be a massive hit, and you've sent it to three labels and they're all bogged down with their own um, roster of releases and you may get no's for that reason and they say, no, sorry doesn't necessarily mean no sorry it's a bad track it could just mean no sorry we're pretty full up with our releases so that's just something else to take on board you know i know that on day one the first time that the, def that the defected team heard end or pump it up they didn't instantly reply and go please can we sign this record they watched it grow the people behind Endor and Endor's management did some very strategic placement of that as a promo and got it played by a certain select circle of DJs. And what happened was Defected saw it connecting. And once they saw it connecting, that's when they decided to sign it. Um, so it wasn't like they didn't hear, they heard that record very early before anybody else. 
and it wasn't instantly signed, but they still signed it early enough to be before anybody else. Um, just got a question here from, from uh, Declan. Um, I was wondering what the A&R process looks like after someone's been signed. That's, it's pretty simple, actually. You find the first track, obviously, and generally the first track is from the demos that you've sent in the first round. But I, I did touch it on it right at the start, just in case some people have missed it. But it's super important to have other ideas ready to go. And literally, when you release your first track, you should have three or four ideas ready for your second track. Because it takes a few months to get the first track out. It's, it's you know a few weeks of, of getting mixes done or, or artwork done or hype video done. And by the time your track's out, it could be eight weeks after you sent your demo, possibly 12 weeks after you sent your demo. So in those 12 weeks, you should be making lots of other demos. So then your A&R person and your label can go, okay, we've got the next track ready to go. Sometimes if you've got a sample, that can take six months to clear. People think samples are easy to clear. They are absolutely no way at all easy to clear. Well, uh, sometimes they can be, but... Often Some, not. Yeah, often not, particularly with big American labels. And you've got uh, one super, super important point that a lot of people still to this day don't get. Songs are broken up into two halves. One half is the master, which is the audio, which is what Vicious Recording signs. And then the other half is the notes or lyrics or melodies. That's basically sits in the publishing world. So publishers look after that. Um, so if, if you've done a, say a cover version of a song, generally that cover version will need to be cleared. Um, or if you've done a song with a sample in it, say, uh, sam say, I don't know, you, you've sampled earth, wind and fire and you've got a little one second snippet and that's looped through your track. We have to go to earth, wind and fire publishers. And if you want to use it in the song, as in, in other words, uh, your ears hear the recorded audio of earth, wind and fire, then that's, it has to be cleared with the label that owns Earth, Wind and Fire. You, we could always replay it. So therefore you just only clear the publishing, but just think of every single song and it's, it's never changed. Every single song in the world has two halves, the publishing half and the physical half, which used to be physical, but obviously is now in the digital world, but still is the audio side and the publishing side. So it's super important to take that on board. Um, and yeah, it's a long, a long answer. Um, Declan, but yeah, it's, it's basically have more demos ready to go. And then that process can happen um, with either, you know, giveaways or your next single and you can plan your third single, you can plan your fourth single. And that's again, what we did with Avicii, we planned and planned and planned. So we had the next six months planned as soon as we released the first track. One of the things that happens once you've signed a deal, you'll have a certain time frame or release commitment as part of that deal. And <clears throat> Um, you know, that's where the development um, <clears throat> side of your career really starts to, to bloom because you've obviously, you've got that first deal, but I mean, you can't stop working then. You can't think I'm done now. This is it. The record label does everything. And in fact, in this day and age, probably the record label probably, um, <clears throat> you know, we obviously play a part, but you've got more connectivity directly with your, your fan base and artists than you've ever had in the history of music. You know, you couldn't talk to Michael Jackson 25 years ago. You can message the biggest pop stars in the world now on Twitter, on their Facebook page. Now, whether or not it's exactly them who are replying to you, maybe not, but sometimes it will be them. And as an artist, you've got more reach than you've ever had and you need to work that harder than you've ever done it before, even after you're signed. So you can't have a mentality that once you're signed, you're done. That's when the hard work starts. But certainly from a development of music, we look at everything that you've got and then we'll start to plan, okay, this record could be next, this one's stronger. Maybe that one doesn't work. Maybe this one you could use as a giveaway. And then we try and obviously attach you to remixes through our own label potentially we try and do that through some other labels. Um, <clears throat> so part of the development is also trying to upskill you, um, not only with the songs that you're making, but obviously production techniques. And when we team you up with somebody, you might hear something that comes back um, and you might go, wow, that sounds great. 
or you may even collaborate with somebody because we've suggested, hey, you know what, this song, we don't think it's quite down a production tip. Maybe you should team up with this person and, and see what you come out with. And that might inspire you and you might learn from that process. So I think what, what people are trying to do once they sign you any label is trying to make sure that your music gets better, that um, the feedback that you're getting is about improving your songs and your production and everything about what you do. And obviously in the coming series that we're going to do in the coming weeks, we've got some things about the business affairs side of things. And we've also got some things about the, um, uh, the, the way songs, um, royalties and all that stuff work and also management. So that also comes in because obviously as you grow as an artist, you may get a manager, you may get a tour manager. They're going to help you do things and, that all becomes something that we as a label are coordinating. So as you get through your deal, um, that's some of the things that, that come through. Sorry, uh, another question from, um, I'm just going back through, through these. Um, from Rob, um, Redux in Melbourne. What are our feelings on approaching major labels as opposed to small labels? I mean, personally, you just got to understand where your music fits. I mean, the first thing I would say is that a lot of major labels, actually they find their music through independent labels. So behind, you know, um, you know, uh, a stack of artists, there's actually somebody in between. I mean, Taylor Swift is famous for having an entire team that, okay, she's got a major label deal and I think she's got her own label now, but, um, there's a whole bunch of people who are in the process way before the major label come into the, into the picture, even though they were involved. Um, Andy Guy, what's your thoughts on exactly you know, I, I, versus I, I, small? I think major labels are amazing. If you've got a major hit and they can, they've got a larger reach so they can hit things a lot, a lot larger because they've got, you know, 10 times the stuff, a hundred times the stuff, a thousand times the stuff of what Vicious has. But Vicious also does sign our tracks on to major labels. So when you sign to say someone like Vicious, you're not just signing to Vicious. We have the opportunity to speak to major labels around the world where individuals may not. Do you know what I mean? You, you can't just email Sony in New York. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and they deliberately don't want every man and his dog to email them because they just don't have that facility. It's better for a smaller label, if you're a dance producer, to go with a smaller label. But there, there are, like, like John said, there are definitely pluses and minuses. The, the, the plus with a major is they have that large reach, but the amazing plus with a smaller label is you get that very, very detailed attention. It's kind of like um, going in a class with say three or four people in your class that's your class and the teacher really attends to the three or four students. But imagine going in a class with 10,000 students. You, you just wouldn't get the teacher's attention. It's kind of a little bit like that. And I'll give you an example. I won't say who the artist is, but he signed a, a track that was a big hit for him to uh, a big label. I won't even mention the label, but you'll be able to work out. Um, it's one of the you know, few majors. He went to the UK, which is where they signed his track. And he met with the A&R people. They were super excited um, and the deal was all fantastic. The next time he went there, the person that he signed the track to was fired. The entire department, dance department in that area was fired. So he basically walked into a room for the meeting with that person who had been fired that week and there was no one left. So he signed that track. He, and luckily he got it back, um, the track back, but Basically, and I've done it before too, I've signed tracks to labels and they've done nothing with it for three months, nothing with it for six months. And I've had to email the, the head of the company and say, guys, you've done nothing with this record. And they say, well, you can have it back now. And it's happened many times. And six months later, the buzz has gone on that track or, or you know, genres have changed or, or styles have changed. So majors can be very scary on that front. So, uh, and still to this day, we have artists that were signed that we went, that was a total mistake because we signed that artist to a major. So sometimes majors, they, they're just too big for their own good. So that's something definitely to keep in mind. I mean, something that I'll add, which really comes down to the core of everything we've been talking about is the people who you're working with. You know, 
Um, the advantages of smaller labels is you're probably going to know the team. You're probably, in the case of, you know, if you signed a defected, Simon Dunmore, he owns the business and he's part of the people that are signing you. Um, if you sign to Vicious, Andy and myself and Guy, who's been there for, you know, 12 years, we are the team. So you know directly who your network is and you learn your, um, your supporters. We are going into bat for you at Spotify. We're going into bat for you at Triple J with Damien or whoever it might be from the company. So not just us, but any smaller label, the advantage is you potentially know the team. And if they love what you do, you know that the people who are releasing your music love your songs. The bigger the label gets, the harder it may be to have the total team across your music. And certainly when it comes to majors, you know, you're competing internally with superstars. You know, the person that's doing publicity is doing publicity for, um, you know, Dua Lipa and Madonna and um, Robbie Williams and, you know, Justin Bieber. So now, obviously, the plus is that if you're an Australian artist and you're signed to those labels, all of those artists aren't available to go into radio. So you've just got to figure out, I think, where your music sits and have some understanding of the team around you and what they bring to the table. You may not be ready. I mean, a good example is in relation to playlists. If, if somebody who's got their first ever record goes straight on to the biggest playlist on Spotify, potentially all the people who are listening to that pop hits playlist, they skip your song. And they skip your song because they don't know who you are and they don't know anything about you because you're not almost big enough to be in that world yet. And that's where, you know, you, you need to sum up deals of majors versus smaller labels and independents. And also we'll go over it in the week four um, session that we do in a month's time, the last one that we've got scheduled. But there's also a difference with deals. And a lot of the time, a deal with a major as, a, as an actual contract will be quite different to a deal that you'll do with an independent label. Um, a question here from Arden. If a sample can't be cleared, what would an A&R team do with the track if they like it and feel it's a hit? Well, the first thing we do is bang our heads against the wall and go, why the hell can't somebody else see this? But we've been going through a process at the moment on a record and um, you just have to be patient. Andy, you want to weigh in here? You've had a few records like this where... Yeah, we've had, we've had multiple things. We've had tracks um, we've, that we've released that we thought were fine to do um, as a cover, for example, and then the artist, you know, six months down the track said, oh, remove that, I don't want that cover to be out. And you kind of find out later that they are actually doing their own version of their own re-release of their song. So that can happen with covers. With samples, um, sometimes uh, we've found, particularly with American artists, they want an advance. So sometimes they'll just say, no, sorry. And um, because I'm kind of like a person that won't give up, I'll email the people and say, what's the reason? Why did you deny this? And then sometimes you find out, uh, 20 emails down the track, oh, actually, we just required an advance and you didn't offer one. And I'm like, well, we, okay, we'll offer one. And it, what ended up being a no turned out to be a yes. And we've actually got a track now that sampled a Motown track. And uh, we're now actually going to release it because we were persistent. So sometimes a no can end up being a yes. And the last way, sometimes a no can end up being an absolute no which is terrible. Um, and then you're gonna to have to look at making something that's somewhat similar um, in feeling and sound. Uh, and that can be done as well. So it kind of feels like Uptown Funk is a great example. It feels like a bunch of other funk tracks from the past. Some of those funk tracks ended up suing them because it feels way too close. But um, if you look up a song called Oops Upside Your Head, Uptown Funk by the Gap Band, sounds exactly like Uptown Funk in, in sections, like so close it's scary. So that's another angle. And I believe, this is my personal belief, that Uptown Funk was heavily influenced or actually sampled artists and then took the samples out and then played samples that were similar because the, that is a great approach. It's a great approach if you want to write a disco house track or a funk track, sample the funk track and sing over the top of it or get your singers to over the top or produce over the top. 
because it can give you great inspiration and you can you can connect with some of the greatest players in history and, and they can be on your song we've, we've cleared big samples before very big samples sister sledge samples things like that we've cleared them before um you know basically just by approaching them and paying the money that needs to be paid so um yeah it can they can be cleared and sometimes definitely they can't be yeah i mean the interesting thing is we talked about before there's two rights in music there's the written work which is covered by publishers and the original writers and there's the recorded work which is the master recording that's generally owned by record labels or sometimes those rights have reverted back to artists but um, if the writers don't want something covered, you're at a dead end. If um, Paul McCartney says, I don't want this cover of my Beatles song ever to come out because I don't like your version, they don't have to say why. They don't have to say anything. They can just say, we deny this cover. And that's the end of it. You cannot do anything about it. Most people are pretty positive about having their music replayed and they're getting a share in it because they're getting the writing credit and they're getting paid as a writer. They're getting that publishing royalty as opposed to the master royalty because you've made a new master. So, you know, there's no guarantees, but it can come to a dead end, obviously. But most of the time, we've found most people in our history have been pretty positive. I think we've had two covers flat out denied. Um, and well, we've had three covers flat out denied and two of them were because they had their own versions coming out again. So they wanted space in the market. And obviously because they were the writers, they had the ability to say no to any other version, therefore leaving no cover versions of that song in the market when they re-released their version. Um, but outside of that, we've only had one person in the history of Vicious ever just go, we don't care, you can't do this. And that was a very well-off artist. They didn't need the money. They didn't care. They just were like, no, nah, we're not doing it. So um, there's, a, there's a good question there. I just noticed, John, from uh, Dan uh, asking about uh, the idea of partnerships, label exclusivity. We've seen it go uh, right and wrong with guys like Martin Garrix. What should artists look for with exclusive deals? It's a really good question. Exclusive deals is kind of like a marriage. And some marriages end in divorce and some marriages end in wonderful things and family and kids and, you know, being together for 50 years. It's exactly the same. So we did touch on that right at the start. If you like a label, if you like what Vicious does, look up the label and go, how long have they been around? Have all their artists been with them for a long time? Because the, the kind of the proof is in the pudding. I think the saying is um, it's, you can see if someone's if someone's got a lot of artists that have been with them for 10 15 years then that label i believe is seen to be a label that looks after people some labels just don't pay royalties don't pay their artists at all and they have to sue them some big labels don't um like major labels i've seen them you know be investigated for just not paying for this or not paying for that so sometimes labels can be dodgy and it's definitely something to be wary of but that's why you have a lawyer when you do a deal and that lawyer looks at your deal and makes sure that there's ways to get out of contracts. If, for, for example, no one's paying the royalties or, for example, if the label's doing the wrong things or failing to release the tracks. So there's definite things that you can get a lawyer to look over um, and assist you because deals can be super complicated. Um, but John did touch on the fact that you do need to have multiple tracks of the label to get that label to invest in you because no one's going to invest and this is one point we haven't touched on. Songs cost a lot of money to release and promote. It's not about just making a song. You can make a song for no money, just your time. But if you're going to do artwork, if you're going to do promo, if you're going to do DJ promo, if you're going to do hype videos, if you're going to do video clips, it can go from 1,000 to 5,000. Then you do remixes, it can go to 10,000. Then you do video clips, it can go to 20,000. And that can happen and has happened um, Don't Call Me Baby was over 50,000 to, to release that song. Not at the start, at the song, at the start, start was just a couple of thousand dollars to release and promote it, but it ended up costing over 50,000, actually more, closer to 100,000 because there was a, some remixes in there, um, the drainers and, and people that were ridiculously overpaid. 
Um, we actually got, got a remix for Armin Van Buren when he was a young, young, young DJ, super young DJ. So there was extreme expenses in that package. Obviously not at the start, but they ended up being there. So, so if you're gonna sign to a label, you're gonna have to marry that label for a while to say, I'm committed to you in the same way you committed to a marriage. I'm committed to you for this four releases, six releases, eight releases, because I believe in your label and I believe in you. And then the label needs to believe in the artist back and spend that 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. And even in relation to Martin Garrix, I mean, you know, his first song was huge, but was that partly huge because he, the label committed to pushing that song super hard and really got behind it. It's a combination of a great song Excuse at me, the right second. time. But, you know, um, just because eventually an artist moves to a different label or moves on, it doesn't always mean that the initial deal was terrible at the time. It may have been a great deal at the time, but the artist has moved into a different area or changed styles or grown in a different way. And now the, the label and the artist doesn't align as much. Um, we're going to wind it up there. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, next week, we're going to do one uh, 7 p.m. on Tuesday night. We're changing the times a bit so that international people can get involved. Um, next week's going to be a little bit about marketing and promotion. We've got Angie from Exposed um, PR joining us, who's a PR and publicist person from Melbourne that's worked a whole bunch of stuff. Obviously, Damien from our office who looks after our marketing. So uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody, and I look forward to seeing you um, next week, stay safe, and uh, we'll see you soon. Cheers.